Thank you very much, Gabriel, for, for doing this, for your time. Uh, very much appreciated. Low-caf coffee, it seems to be a new kind of, of trend. Is that your impression as well? Yeah, we have been getting lots of demand and requests from clients from all over the world um, on decaf coffee. So this is uh, probably a growing trend around the market. Lots of people have some kind of intolerance to caffeine or they just want to have coffee but to reduce the caffeine intake depending on the time of the day and everything. Sometimes um, decaf coffee doesn't taste as good because of the process to remove the caffeine that can be a little bit invasive and low calf coffee they, they are showing to be a good alternative to that. Is there an official definition for low calf coffee? For example, the amount of caffeine <clears throat> that low calf coffee is allowed to have? No, there is no uh, specific rule or a, a specific um, amount of caffeine that will determine what a low calf coffee is. For decaf, yes, you have th that rule. If I'm not mistaken, that's uh, 0.2 if I'm not mistaken, something. because regular Arabica is around 1.4 uh, in terms of caffeine content. That's the regular Arabica. And of course, different varietals will have different quantities as well. Um, Robusta will have something around 3% of caffeine. So Arabica is already half of Robusta. When you think about some of the low caffeine varietals that we have at the farm, what we use as a um, as a measure is below 1%. So every time we have a varietal that when we do the tests and we analyze and we, in our case, it's below 1%, we consider that ver that varietal, that specific lot, a low-calf coffee. What kind of varieties do we grow at Atala? For low-calf, we have Aramosa and we have Laurina as well. Both of them are low-calf varietals. Our Aramosas, they have being um, around 0 0.7, uh, 0 0.8. So it's usually half of the Arabica, the regular Arabica, right? And our Lorinas, they have been usually measuring around 0 0.4, 0 0.5. So it's really very, very low, almost no caffeine uh, right off the tree. Do we know why they have I mean, these varieties, do we know why these varieties have such a low caffeine level? Is it something to do with genetics or it's has there a, been any it's reason? Genetics, yes, it's genetics. Um, of course, there are lots of different characteristics that will make those varietals display more or less caffeine, but pretty much it's another characteristic that is in, in, inherent from the varietal. Some varietals will be more acidic, some varietals will, be, will have more body, some varietals will be sweeter, some varietals will have more caffeine or less caffeine. Usually, the low calf varietals, they tend to be more fragile, not only because of the caffeine content, of course, there, there's a series of factors that will make a varietal more fragile or stronger to a specific pests, diseases, climate, and all of those things. Caffeine is one of them. Caffeine can be an extra um, support for the varietal because caffeine is poisonous. If you drink too much of it, you might die. Of course, that's a lot of caffeine, right? We might be getting there in the office. Right, yeah. So yeah, but, but, but it is. So when you think about, for example, insects, um, they will be more likely to attack uh, in, a, in a more intensive way varietals with less caffeine than varietals with caffeine. Because if you have less caffeine, they can actually attack more those varietals because it has a smaller quantity of caffeine, which is a poisonous substance in a way, right? But of course, it's not the only, the only factor. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we don't see lots of low caffeine varietals out there in the market, even though it's it's growing right now because of this that we have already spoken about. Um, but it's still something that is quite rare. Uh, it's varietals that are difficult to produce most of the times because they're sensitive. So we have to keep a closer eye while they are being produced. 
I was just going to ask how you as Terra deal with the challenges that come with low cash coffee. I mean, are there any specific measures that you can undertake to make sure that you save or harvest as much of these very sensitive plants as possible? It's a long, long process, to be honest. We have partnerships with many research issues in Brazil and also from other parts of the world. Uh, there is one specific institute that we have lots of uh, projects in partnership with them, which is the uh, Campinas Agronomical Institute, IAC. And we have a field in the farm with lots of different genetic materials. So right now we have around 130 different varietals, different genetics that we are researching. But they are in total, it's not just low cap. But... That's in total, that's everything yeah. for different purposes. And low calf is one of the things that we test on that field. If you think about it, um, when these new varietals come to the farm, they are not used to our climate, to our soil, to our terroir in general. So we have to do an adaptation process. So first of all, we have a few trees of that specific varietal. Uh, we analyze those trees, might be 10, 15 trees of one specific genetics. And then we look in the, uh, we look each of those trees individually and we select the ones that are the best ones. So after four years, we get the seeds and then we replant only the best ones, only seeds from the best ones. And then we transfer to a new field. And then when they go to this new field, we're going to plant something around 45 trees. And then we're going to select the best ones again. And then we transfer to another field. So this whole process might take around 12 years just for us to adapt that varietal, if it's a very specific and difficult varietal, to our reality, to our microclimate, right? Um, so this is the first thing that we do. When you get these very exotic varietals, this is a one thing that we do. We adapt everything and we select what really uh, merges into our in, in our ecosystem. And then after that, it's the regular uh, agricultural management, which is fertilizing and irrigation and applying defensives if needed. And then in those specific cases for those varietals, because they are more fragile, we have to be checking them more often. We send people to the field, we bring samples from the leaves, samples from the beans to see if there is any specific pest, insect, disease that is taking over that area so we can actually treat that specific area um, faster and be more efficient doing that as well. So that's pretty much how we do it. Um, if you think about Lorena, just to give you an example of how difficult it is to produce it, it took us 20 years to adapt Lorena to our to our environment. We tested Lorena with different partners from different parts of the world because we saw there was potential there and there there, there could be uh, some opportunities coming from that specific varietal in the future, both for a cup profile and also for for the caffeine content that is very, very low. But then we lost lots of Lorena on the process. So we estimate we lost around 200 hectares of Lorena trying to adapt it to our reality because it was a very complicated varietal. Nowadays, we adapted it to our reality, but still, still, when we plant Lorena in the field, 30% of the trees die. And then we have to replant and another 30% die. And then, you know, so to start a new Lorena plantation, it's very laborsome, it's very costly, it's very difficult. So I don't think it's ever going to be a variety that we can produce in scale. It's always going to be something that is quite small, um, quite restrict and quite rare at the same time. Because it's a big risk for you as Daterra, for you as a company as well, to you know, work on these varieties for 20 years and lose 30% of the plants in the process yeah well, how did you there are a couple of questions but how did you get the idea how did you make the decision to start this process or the experiment carrying low cap coffee well uh, lorena was one of the first the first ones that we we started researching back uh in the beginning of the, the year 2000 right 
um, about 20 years ago. And the idea was really trying to find a variety that would be low in caffeine, just for the sake of knowledge and research. Let's see how it behaves. Let's see what it is like. There pull the, the one decaf, so maybe this could be a good opportunity. There is no uh, low calf out there in the market, and the, the taste profile was very good as well. So that that was why we wanted to produce this varietal, and we we dedicated so much time and effort um, to do that. The Ramosa was sort of the same thing for us. It was another option for low calf coffee. Um, was in partnership with the Agronomic Research Institute of Campinas, same institution that that actually. The Lorena that we have nowadays is there. But the thing is, Aramosa is not an official varietal name. It's, um, let's say, a nickname, for example, because Aramosa pretty much means Arabica plus Rasemosa, which are two different coffee species, right? Um, so, what those researchers they were doing, they wanted to introduce Arabica flavors, Arabica profiles into. Uh, and also combine that with racemosa characteristics that were interesting. For example, resistance to drought and resistance to some pests like leaf miner. So that was what they wanted. There are dozens of different types of aramosa, meaning arabica with racemosa. Most of the times you don't know what's the arabica that is in there. It is a Katue, it is a Mundo Novo, it is a Bourbon. What, what is the Arabica that was crossed with Rasemosa? I've tasted Aramosas from many countries around the world, from many places, and they taste completely different because you never know what kind of Aramosa is. Aramosa is more of a, a genetics group, Arabica with Rasemosa, rather than a varietal. It's not a varietal, if you want to see what I mean. The Aramosa that we have at the Terra, it was an experimentation that they did, and they crossed uh, some Blue Mount Mountain coffee as the Arabica with Rasemosa, and then they crossed it back with uh, Arabica species, Arabica varietals, but those varietals, they are not specified. So we don't actually know <laughs> 100% what is in there. We just know there is some Blue Mountain, some Racemosa there. And it tastes great. It tastes very floral. It tastes like grapes, which is not common for Brazilian coffee, right? And it has low caffeine. Maybe if you taste Aramosa from other places or other kinds of Aramosa, they will have different flavors and maybe they're not, they're not going to be low in caffeine as well. It's always important to think about that when you, when you hear the term aramosa. But Lorena in general is low in caffeine always. That's the characteristics of the, that specific varietal. Lorena is established varietal. And Lorena is from Arabica as well. Lorena is Arabica. Uh, it's a natural mutation from bourbon. So it happened for the first time in the Reunion Island. Um, some agronomists, they, they spotted, they planted bourbon there. Or, or actually, the Reuna Island in the past, it was called the Island of Bourbon. That's why it has this name, the, the varietal. And then some bourbon trees, they mutated into something different. A tree with uh, that had a Christmas tree shape, right? like a pine tree, smaller leaves, long cherries with long beans, looking like a, a rice grain, pretty much. Uh, different flavor, different characteristics, different everything. So it was a natural mutation that happened in nature there, and it came from bourbon. Some people even call Lorena bourbon pontu, which is like French for pointy bourbon, because it has this pointy, uh, pointy shape, both in the tree and both, and, and also in the beans. And since they come from Réunion, are there any regions where you can't grow Lorena or Amorosa or other kinds of low calf uh, varieties? Well, I wouldn't say if there are regions. I, 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 I wouldn't know, actually. Uh, probably they would struggle more as any Arabica, but more, even more 
in lower altitudes uh, because a more static climate helps a lot producing those varietals. And I would say that's that's probably one of the main the main characteristics. Lower altitudes wouldn't wouldn't be suitable for for those varietals because they are very demanding in terms of steady climate, less plagues, less diseases. You find that in higher altitudes. And uh, we mentioned in the beginning that robusta has, uh, generally speaking, more caffeine than arabica. Are yes. there any low-cap varieties from Robusta at all, or are they all from Arabica? Maybe there, there are, but not that I know of. Um, we haven't heard so far of experiments or researches to produce low-cap Robusta. Uh, if there, are, there is anything on that sense, I, I don't know of, of it. But we at the farm, in terms of new Arabica, uh, low calf varietals we are researching in many different senses. So the IAC Institute actually found a specific genet genetic material that is almost caffeine ca caffeine less from the tree, lower than Lorena. It has 0.0004% of caffeine. So it's, it's really a no calf rather than low calf. Yeah, it's no calf. It's no calf. It says is that coffee is an Arabica varietal that they they found in nature in an expedition in Ethiopia, and they are researching that here in Brazil right now, and it's a very interesting material still not available commercially, so that's a new uh, possibility for a low calf in the future that could be very interesting as well because it's really like pregnant women. People with anxiety problems, everyone can drink it and go to bed because caffeine is really almost not there. So that's one possibility. And there is a new research that we are developing in partnership with them. We actually, it's probably you saw that in the email that I sent to you earlier. Um, it's a research with the Agronomic Institute of Campinas with the uh, foundation for support in research of the state of Sao Paulo and some private companies as a coffee company only the terra is a coffee company that is actually enrolled in this research and what they are developing is a zero caffeine varietal so i'll try to explain because it's a lot of cool science stuff well I, I was going to ask you about this anyway when you know you mentioned this in, in, in your email yeah. i wasn't sure whether you would be allowed to talk about it because it sounds yes. so uh, I mean, it's such a it's an original new project. It's a super new project. Now we weren't allowed to talk about that uh, before, but now it's already out there. We already have published it, and we are going to start this research now in 2022. The process when you have government institutions and private institutions is always it always takes a long time. So we have been talking to them for over a year now to organize everything to start this project. So pretty much what this um, research is doing is a technique that is called a genetic scissor. So what they are able to do, they have traced all the DNA of the coffee, the Arabica coffee plant. So they know what the, the genes are there and they have found out what is the specific gene that produces caffeine. What by having that gene, the coffee plant is actually able to display caffeine once it produces. Um, there is a, it's a quite complicated process, but pretty much coffee has theobromine, which is a substance that, that you also find in cocoa, for example. And there is a process that happens because of that gene in coffee that is called theobromine syntax synthesis, which is a process that transforms uh, an alkaloid that is theobromine into caffeine. But what they are doing is for they are doing five different varietals. So they look for that specific gene and they mute that gene. It's not transgenic. It's not those things. You know, it's uh, you pretty much, the gene is still there, but you just 
mute the gene, and then you have lots of scientific techniques to do that. And by muting the gene, it becomes inactive, and this process of theobromine synthesis doesn't happen. So the theobromine doesn't turn into caffeine. And then you're going to be able to produce a zero caffeine coffee. So it's a, it's a very interesting uh, new, totally brand, brand new thing that is being done for the first time here. It's going to take us five years more or less to have first results, not that bad. More thinking... compared to your 20 years with the uh, uh, Lorena, I think that's... Yeah, because the, the way this, this thing is done is, it's, it is meant to be a shorter term kind of research. So it becomes available in the market faster. And probably once you have the plants, in order to multiply them, they're going to work with cloning because cloning makes things faster as well. So it speeds up your ability to replicate that material as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, super, it's super interesting. They are doing with different varietals. So also different flavor profiles are going to be able to be tested as well. Some of them might work, some of them might not work. As any research process, that's how things go, right? You have uh, trials and errors. But yeah, it's it's very exciting. But does that mean if these plants have no caffeine as opposed to you know low caffeine or hardly any caffeine, that they are as fragile as let's say for example Lorena and Amorosa or even more fragile? Could be, and that's part of the research um, proposal as well. What they have done is they have they have chosen some varietals that are more resistant naturally more productive resistant varietals and some varietals they are not as resistant so you have a good mix of varietals from the most resistant ones to the least resistant ones and the idea is uh maybe okay you are taking out the caffeine which could work as an extra protection but these trees they already have some other resistance factors that could be interesting too Right, so that's something we're going to find out during the analysis over the five years. So that means that if we are lucky in five or ten years, we could I could have on my desk, I, I could speak with you over Zoom in ten years, and next to me, as opposed to having a, an empty glass of water, I could have a cup of decaf coffee that wasn't uh, where the, the caffeine wasn't extracted after the harvest yeah. and after the the production, exactly. but yeah. it was naturally grown as decaf. Exactly. And it was natural it, grow, it will grown have, as no calf. And no flavors will be lost because it, the, the caffeine won't be extracted. It was never there in the first place. It was never born with the plant. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah, I'm super excited. I just wish I had a fast forward button mm -hmm. to see what's going to happen in five years. <laughs> How did you get involved as Daterra in this project? Well, we, we are big partners of the IEC Institute. They, they have been working with us for many, many years, over 20 years already. So pretty much everything that, it, that is research, that is genetics, that is new in coffee, we try to be engaged by supporting them in their researches and also being able to bring this new knowledge, this new oxygen into the farm as well. We work with them in many different fronts, from the cultivation to the genetics, and that's how we get engaged. Every time they have something new, they they know that Terra is usually interested, so they come to us as well. Uh, when you process low calf coffee, for example, Lorena and Amorosa, do you process it differently because it is low calf coffee, because they are more fragile? No, no. In the processing aspect, it's the same as any coffee. Um, we know that RMOs and Lorena, they behave, they actually uh, have a very, very good uh, result with fermentation processes, but there are other varietals that are not low calf. They also have a good result in fermentation processes. So I wouldn't attribute that to the low caffeine at all. Um, but the difference in terms of how we produce the other coffees and these coffees is really on the field, on the field side. 
that's where we see lots of differences because really because once they are more fragile we just have to be like really strict and close and treating those trees more often than everything else do you need to use any chemicals uh, in order to fend off insects or bugs and other pests yeah well we do use uh defensives uh on those trees as we do in any other areas of the farm but the thing that we do as i was explaining to you is we never apply chemicals or uh, defensives without spotting the disease there so pretty much what we have is we have lots of teams in the farm they go to the field they collect leaves from that field in many different spots and then we count, okay, how many leaves have leaf rust? How many leaves have leaf miner? How many leaves? And there's this, a specific index that tells you, oh, it's under control or no, it's not under control. So we have to apply something here. What we do more in those areas is this checkup, like a doctor. You have some symptoms in your body, you go to the doctor. The doctor is going to ask for exams. He's going to see, oh, you are low in this on your blood for example. So you have to take this medicine, you have to take this measure. It's the same thing. We do these exams, these x-rays on that field, on those fields more often. So if anything goes out of the out of control, we are able to treat that specific area before it gets out of control. So that's that's how it happens on those fields. There's a lot of work involved in all these low cat varieties and growing them and, and, and harvesting. Now, obviously, it must be financially sustainable for you, otherwise you wouldn't do it. Um, mm -hmm. But do you have any plans of well, expanding uh, your, your field in terms of, of low cat varieties? Do you plan on growing more of them because the demand has increased? It is difficult to imagine those varietals on the large scale. And when I'm talking large scale is like 200 hectares, 300 hectares, hundreds of coffee bags being produced, thousands of coffee bags being produced every year. So it's difficult to think about that just because they are very intensive in work and cost and everything. And again, if you have a big field, it's more difficult for you to spot those little nuances, those little pests and diseases. So it's something that we, we face as a challenge nowadays. We are expanding those fields and analyzing how that goes and especially distributing those fields in different areas of the farm. So that they are not too close from each other. So if there isn't any of them that gets a disease or a pest, for example, it just doesn't spread out throughout all the fields at the same time, right? And in, at the same time, we are also researching those new low calves, right? So we have Lorena, we have Ramosa, we are very happy with them. We are expanding little by little. It's not going to be very, very big, but we are expanding. But for the future, we're going to have new things, which are these zero calves and naturally or with the genetic scissor. Do you think that's the reason why so f I mean, relatively few farms and even relatively few countries grow low cap varieties such as Lorena and Amorosa because they don't have the manpower, the capability or ability in whatever way uh, is needed to grow them and harvest them successfully so that it's financially sustainable for them? Yeah, the, the two varietals that nowadays are more well known are Lorena and Amorosa, those two. And when you talk about them, it's too difficult to find the seeds. It's too difficult to, to find them out there. So they spread out uh, with more frequency. They are very difficult to produce. They produce very few coffee as well. So they're not high productivity varietals. They're, they are very, very low productivity varietals. And they give a lot of work. So when a producer plants, plants a field, of Lorena and 30% of those trees die, he gets scared. He's like, okay, am I going to really risk and put my money on this? What if it doesn't work? What if more trees die over time? And also thinking that 
it's going to yield a very little amount of coffee. So, okay, it might pay off, but it might not. And then when you think about the investments producers have to do, it's not a very safe bet, you know? You have to be to really believe and do it little by little. You cannot just go out there and plant 200 hectares of Florida, just so you understand. So that's why you don't have much of it in the market. But more and more people are becoming curious because it it's getting some attention. But everyone is still on the stages of, let me plant a little field and see how it goes. And then anything coffee takes years. So four years from there, you see the first results. And then, okay, now I'm planting another field. So you see, maybe in 10 years, 15 years, we're going to have lots of it in the market because people are just giving these first baby steps towards producing it. We started first, so that's why we have more of it available. But I'm pretty sure there will be more in the future. Um, so yeah, that, that's pretty much it. I, I think we are in the process of having other producers getting acquainted to those varietals and starting to get courage to produce, but little by little increasing. I, I think there'll be more in the future. I was just going to ask, and I don't know how much time you have, I don't want to keep you too long. Um, but let's presume I'm thinking about a career change and I want to become a, a coffee farmer in Ethiopia. And as far as I know, I'm sure there are a few uh, low cap varieties being grown in Ethiopia. I'm not aware of any, but I'm sure they exist. But let's yeah. say I, as a farmer, want to grow Lorina and Amorosa. How, where would I get the seeds from? Well, uh, in Ethiopia, I wouldn't know, uh, really. I, I don't know how, how they get those seeds there. Uh, but here in Brazil, the correct way to do it is through the research institutes, like IAC and other institutes there here in Brazil. Uh, also because those institutes, they really know the traceability of those seeds they will tell you, oh, this is an aromosa that is low caffeine. Oh, this is an aromosa that is not low caffeine. They will tell you that. Um, over time, you have also some nurseries, commercial nurseries that produce those varietals and they have a menu of varietals. They have Katuai, they have Ikatu, they have Bourbon, they have everything. And some of them, not all of them, because it's too rare and difficult to find, they will have Lorena, they will have aromosa, but again, I don't know if the Ramosa they are selling there is the low calf one. Maybe you are going to plant and then when you send to the lab, it's not low calf. It's a different kind of a Ramosa, right? Lorena usually is low calf. But to be on the safe side, it's better to always send samples to a lab so the lab can check caffeine content before you actually sell. Even us, for example, we know Lorena is low calf. We know Aramosa is low calf. But every year, when the first production comes out, we get this, the samples, we send to the lab, and we test it. Because we want, if we sell low calf, we want to be 100% sure that those varietals they produce low calf in that year. Because maybe rainfall, sunshine was different, and caffeine just goes up, right? And it happened already. Our, we had an year that our Lorena was at 0 0.7. It was higher. And we had years that it was 0 0.3. So you have some oscillation. If it goes above one, we cannot sell as low calf. So in that can year, you know we're why not that is? I mean, it happens. You... It's nature. It's nature. Flavor profile changes. Everything, you know, from one year to the, to, to the other. For some specific reason, increased in that specific year. We cannot say. Uh, specifically, and we have the certificates for caffeine content. So if our clients want us to send a certificate, we can send that as well to prove those coffees are low caffeine. So what I would recommend roasters before they buy low calf from any farms around the world, they should request, okay, do you have the certificates for low calf for this crop production? Because that's very important. We had the years the Aramosa was, be, be, uh, was above 1% and we could not sell it as low calf because naturally you have one os you have oscillation. So getting the certificate every year, and it's very simple, you just get a sample sent to a lab, you pay for the lab and the lab will tell you, okay, this has 
X amount of caffeine. The last aspect I want to talk about is you sell the Aramosa, at least to us, as, a, as an anaerobic uh, coffee. So it's anaerobic processing. We sell um, in many different processes. We, we have many different processes for Aramosa and also for Lorena. Every year we do a little bit of natural, a bit of poked, a little of bit of anaerobic, honey, aerobic as well. So we do that every year. Um, what scores really amazing above 90, we auction. And then there are different markets that will buy those coffees and try to snatch some boxes for them. Usually our Muslim arena, they are always great. They always score above 87, 88. So usually they, they are in our masterpieces range and then we'll sell a little bit to different markets. So maybe the one that you have now is the anaerobic, which usually for Aramosa works very well, but we do other processes as well, not just that one. Uh, I was going to ask is, well, first of all, can you explain what the anaerobic processing involves? What it develops, you said. No, sorry, what it involves. How do you ah, okay, sure. process anaerobic? Yeah. Um, and when you say anaerobic, we actually mean the anaerobic fermentation, right? So uh, the way the fermentation happens, you can ferment coffee in many different ways. You can ferment coffee on the paleo, you can ferment coffee on the water tanks, like washed, for example, and you can ferment coffee anaerobically, as we are doing very much in coffee. Some people will call it semi-carbonic maceration, some people will call it anaerobic natural, there are different names for it, but pretty much what you do is you put the coffee cherries or the coffee beans just after you harvest them into a tank and you close it. Usually there is a, a valve, an airlock valve that allows oxygen to leave this tank and only CO2 remains inside because fermentation develops CO2 and then it pushes out all the oxygen and then you have only CO2. And that's why we call it anaerobic because it's happening in an environment that has no oxygen, only carbonic gas. That's, that's how it, it works pretty much. And then you have different variations. You can do it with the skin, you can do it without the skin, you can do it with the mucilage, you can do it with water, with no water, but in this anaerobic environment pretty much. Well, you can, of course, directly compare a, let's say, an uh, Aramosa, which has been fermented anaerobically, uh, as opposed to, let's say, washed uh, or a natural. Okay. Aramosa naturally, naturally has three main, our Aramosa, again, okay, because there are different kinds of Aramosa. This one with the Blue Mountain in the mix has three G main characteristics they are very typical of it first florals usually reminding of coffee blossom or jasmine different from the ethiopian profile because you also have lots of flowers there or panamanian um, it's a flower that is more it reminds more of the coffee blossom in a way second characteristic that we, we see a lot in aramosa in different intensities is grapes so it might be raising if it's a natural aromosa. It might be green grapes if it's washed aromosa. It might be wine if it's anaerobic fermented aromosa, for example. So you have the grape in different stages depending on the process, which is quite fun. And honey. You have lots of honey presence in aromosa as well. Um, reminding of honey or honeycomb sometimes. So those three things, they're almost always in Aramosa. And then depending on the process, you get different intensities of them. So um, when we have Aramosa as natural, as I said, you have the raising, you have uh, th this honey is more like sometimes molasses or honey, honey-like. And then if you go to the anaerobic ones, you have all these dark berries, dark fruits, along with the grape, but you also have blackberries, you have blueberries, and all those more intense fruits. And then if you talk about the, if you talk about the, the, the washed ones, it's going to be lighter, 
green grapes, yellow fruits with honey uh, and with flowers as well. Do potential customers approach you and say directly, we want to have X kilogram of Aramosa, but anaerobically fermented and not washed no. or fermented? Do they have very specific ideas, some of them, when they buy or want to buy from you? Uh, yeah, some clients, they have specific ideas of volumes and um, but usually in terms of processes, what we do is because we don't have a lot of it, we make quantities as we know historically that they are coming out, right? And then at the end of the season, we say, hey, roasters or hey, importers, we have this amount of poked, this amount of honey, this amount of natural that we could produce this year. And then they start reserving whatever they, they, whatever we have. It's different from our big production because in our big, big production, we can actually adapt to what they, they want in terms of quantities. But in our Muslim arena, because we just have a little bit of them, it's, it's harder. So we do a little bit of everything and then we try to uh, distribute those quantities over different markets. Um, thank you very, very much, Gabriel.